Well, I think we will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an economic specialist with NDSU Extension. I uh, work primarily in bioproducts and bioenergy, which hemp is at times a part and also a, a food crop as well. Um, today we have uh, Ryan Beetill from NDSU Extension and Ben Brimlow from InHemp, uh, as well as myself to talk a little bit about producing uh, and marketing hemp grain this year. Uh, just a little bit of background so you know uh, what we're going to do is we're going to work through a, 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 our slide deck. Uh, and during that time, you're welcome to ask any questions you want to using the Q&A feature. Um, but for the most part, we're going to save everything for the end and keep everybody's uh, microphone and camera off uh, so we can give full attention to the speaker. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ben uh, with InHemp. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see uh, the participation we've got here today. Uh, the focus on today is, of course, grain hemp production specifically, but before we jump into that, I want to give a little background on hemp. Uh, a lot of you have heard about hemp in the news. Probably the biggest one is uh, CBD hemp. Um, I have up here the three forms of hemp that are grown today. Uh, the first CBD, fiber, and then seeds and grain. So CBD is that nutraceutical uh, crop. It's grown for biomass, for flowers, where it's taken either cold pressed or using alcohol, some kind of solvent based extraction to remove that uh, nutraceutical um, health compound. It's as far as farming goes, it's pretty intensive, both uh, financially, it's high input cost as, as well as imp inputs with um, labor as well. Uh, the second is fiber. It hasn't really taken off yet in the United States, but it's very big in Asian countries and Europe. Uh, it's grown for obviously the stocks where you get the herd, herd and uh, bast fibers for making textiles, rope, things like that. Production wise, it fits more of a hay operation where you'd be, be growing that, you know, with uh, seeding with a drill and coming back with a swather, uh, baling and off to processing. Um, and then lastly, what we're talking about today is seeds or grain production. Uh, obviously, it's grown for the seeds, for the grain. Um, plant habit is short vertical growth, not unlike your grain crops, wheat, barley, etc. Uh, inputs and production practices are very similar to your, your cereal grains and oil seeds. Um, and out of these three, I believe hemp has the most established market and is going to be increasing in demand. That'll pass off to. So, as far as visual goes, well, uh, CBD looks like, like I say, a horticultural crop or a high, high value vegetable crop. It requires a lot of manual labor, planting. Uh, next. This is what a fiber stand would typically look like. That crop can get up above 10 feet tall. Um, it's, it's then processed to remove that inner core from the bast, uh, Fast fibers produce insulation, uh, shivs, things like that. Uh, next. And this is what a grain crop would typically look like. Uh, you can seed it with your, your disc drill, your, your hoe type drill, no till, conventional. Um, 90, 100 days, you've got a, got a grain crop coming out of your combine and into your bins. And I'll uh, pass it on to Ryan now, who will talk about some NDSU. Yeah, so thanks, Ben. Uh, I'm Ryan Vito. I'm an extension cropping system specialist uh, out here at the Dickinson Research Extension Center in Southwest North Dakota. So recently, I worked with Leslie Lubinow and Burton Johnson to put together a short uh, publication uh, talking about grain production in North Dakota. We kind of cover all aspects of production from what we know so far. Burton Johnson really helped uh, start a lot of this. He's kind of the leader of the hemp program here in North Dakota. Uh, helped, helped kind of get things going off the ground back in 2015, if I remember correctly. He's been pushing for it longer than that. So uh, if you go to the next slide, we'll kind of start talking about planting conditions a little bit. Um, looks like uh, the words that I had were in white text when we switched uh, the backgrounds, but that's okay. So what we really want to have is 
about 12 plants per square foot. All right, that's our optimum plant population. The problem is your germination is very, very low compared to other crops that we typically grow. You gotta think about, you know, these breeding programs aren't as advanced as let's say corn, for example, right? So you're gonna have just not that vigor coming out of that seed. You're not gonna have that seed quality for germination. Uh, you can get pretty good germination, especially with some of these, um, you know, good seed sources, but you gotta make sure that you do a germination test. And even if you do have that good germination, uh, a lot of our research and experience is showing that you want to have an extra 25 to 30 percent, um, you know, plants put out there, seeds put down, uh, to adjust for seedling mortality. And one uh, way to do a germination test is to make a rag doll. So that's taking a paper towel, counting out a certain number of seeds, and then you look at your percentage that germinate over a certain period of time. Uh, I think one way to kind of help adjust for any of that um, early vigor is maybe try doing that germination test in some soil so you can kind of see how that seed reacts to your environment. Uh, hemp really doesn't like that cold soil so you want to be planting a little bit later. Uh, if you plant too early you might get too much biomass uh, because this is uh, daylight sensitive when it switches to seed right so uh, you don't want to have too much of that energy going into that biomass growth. And I would try to plant this in a timeline similar to soybeans for your region. So avoid any frost, um, that's gonna cause some damage. We do have some volunteer hemp that we just sprayed the other day that did come up um, with this nicer, warmer weather. Um, and also you gotta be careful for your herbicide selections, right? But by having that later mid, mid to late May planting date, you can adjust for um, taking care of your weeds with the pre-herbicide application and also kind of get your optimum growth. So there's research from Langdon. If you see on the top right there, there's, they found uh, May 22nd had the best grain yield as well as that best stand density. So if you go to the next slide, so here in Dickinson, we had um, lower stands our best yielding variety was Canda, a little under 900 pounds per acre. If you go to the next slide. So here we're comparing on the left, we have the Dickinson variety trial from last year. And on the right is the Langdon variety trial from last year. So you see those plant stands. In Langdon, they got nearly twice what we've had. They've been growing hemp a few more years. Uh, last year was our first large scale trial out here in Dickinson. In 2018, we had a demonstration that kind of helped us um, figure out a few things, planting and harvest-wise. But uh, we did have lower stands, and with that resulted much lower yields, right? So that stand is very important, so make sure that when you are planting hemp that you're putting, uh, adjusting for germination, as well as uh, that seedling mortality. We go one more slide next. So all the information that you can find um, on NDSU variety trial research, you can find at the, this link in the top left here. And this will show the latest research. We go to the next slide. This is our extension crops page. So this will have any of the latest uh, extension as well as research material that you can find on hemp. You can see our webinar here today. There's one last thing I wanna kinda talk about before I pass it back over to Ben. So go to the next slide. So down in Hedinger, John Rickardson um, took this picture here. So they had an awesome stand. Um, their crop looked really great. And Ben will touch on this a little bit um, later on, but birds can really wreak havoc on, on hemp. So you have those great stands, but they got nearly half of yield of what we had, and most of that went to the birds, right? So um, you really have to be careful with that harvest timing. Um, because those birds will eat a lot of that crop, right? So next slide. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. Also be sure to follow uh, if you're on Instagram, uh, the top one there is DREC Agronomy. That's my work account. If you wanna see a bunch of pictures of my dog as well as some plant science stuff, you can follow my personal account there too. So Ben, uh, I can go back to you.
All righty. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so I'm going to jump a little bit into the agronomy side. Uh, pretty, we're given a 3,000 view, you know, foot view here, but it's at least to get started for those of you interested in raising grain hemp. Um, to start off with, I didn't introduce myself too well, but I'm the agronomist for IMD Hemp out of Fort Benton, Montana. Uh, and we're looking for growers for 2019. So uh, if, if some of this looks like it'll fit your operation, um, we've got 8,000 acres already contracted, but looking for more and uh, ready to help growers cross the border in their North Dakota. So anyways, so to start off with, we got to look into field selection. You can't just put hemp anywhere. You can't just throw seeds out there and let it, let it be and it'll take off and be profitable. Like any other crop, uh, you got to start with a good foundation. Um, hemp does great under, uh, under good nutrition. Alrighty, so first of all, location selection, we want to avoid high clay soils uh, with poor drainage. Uh, so your, your sandy loam or silt loam soils are perfect for, for hemp. Uh, if you got sandy soils, uh, it'd be best to have some kind of irrigation ability there. Um, but hemp will grow in, in you know, precipitation zones all the way down to 12 inches. Crop rotation, Avoid following other oil seeds. When you raise hemp as, an, as a seed, it's more similar to oil seeds and can actually pick up some of the same diseases as your canola, mustard, etc. cetera. Uh, something to be aware of is chemical residue. So if you're following wheat, you're usually okay. If you're following peas or garbs or, or uh, soybeans, if you're using anything like Spartan Charge that has high soil residual, um, you've got to watch those plant back dates and uh, I'm, I'm ready, willing and ready to help if any questions arise on, on, on those chemical residues. Um, most guys are putting it behind their wheat or their barley um, or behind uh, summer fallow if you're in the drier areas. Fertilizer, of course, that's something we all are interested in. We don't want to put too much on, but also we don't want to put not enough. Uh, you know, we're still dialing it in for North Dakota, Montana growers, but for now, the best rule of thumb is a one to 10 ratio. So for every, I should say, for every 10 uh, pounds of seed, you wanna put one pound of nitrogen or one unit of nitrogen. So if you're looking at a thousand or 1500 pound grain projection, you wanna make sure you got 150 total units of nitrogen in the soil between organic matter, soil nitrate, and um, applied nitrogen. Phosphorus levels are usually in the 30 to 40 pounds per, per, uh, per acre. Uh, sulfur 15 to 20. And it's important to keep an eye on your zinc and boron levels. Boron, you might not see a yield bump uh, if you add more a pound or so, but zinc, like any other crop, is, uh, is pretty important. Uh, next. All right, so you've got your fertilizer plan, you got your field picked out. Now we're getting ready for seeding. Uh, you wanna know when to plant, right? You don't wanna plant too early or you'll, you'll get zapped by the frost. You don't wanna to plant too late or you get caught and you might run out of moisture if you're dry land especially. Typical planting dates for North Dakota, Montana is gonna be mid-May to mid-June. I'd, I'd pull that back a little to early June, but most of our guys in Montana growing with us this year are gonna be planting here in a couple weeks. Uh, we wanna make sure there's enough moisture to get germinated and out of the ground. Uh, you wanna make sure that soil temperature is 48 degrees Fahrenheit at your two inch level. Uh, and just be aware with planting date, the earlier you seed, you're gonna get a taller stand uh, in general. The later you seed is gonna be a little shorter. Uh, so if you're concerned about having too high a crop, you can just plant a little later. Uh, seeding rate and depth, like Ryan had already mentioned, we're looking at 10 to 12 plants per square foot. And you wanna get those seeds around a half inch. Uh, if you've got a, got a drill that keeps putting seed too deep or very variable, it's, uh, you wanna 
tune that up a bit. So half inch uh, target, don't go anywhere deeper than a, a, an inch deep. Row spacing, you can, it can handle quite a wide variety. Some guys will seed with, with corn drills, but if you're a grain farmer, just put that seed right how you, in, the, in, the, in the drill you use for your wheat, your canola. Uh, if you're six inch spacing or 10 inch spacing, um, all of those are, are good options. Um, um, I would uh, I would be err on the side of having narrower spacing because uh, that'll help without competing weeds. Um, regarding equipment, conventional grain drills are going to work. Hoe type disc openers going to be just fine. Um, just make sure you can get some consistent seed placement. Um, and uh, if you run an air seeder, turn the wind speed down so you don't end up with cracking. Uh, that could significantly limit uh, your emergence if, if, if your uh, wind speeds are too high. All right, next. All righty. Um, in season management, the best, you know, for the growers that have worked with us in the past, most of them have not gone back into their field until harvest time. So they seed it May, June and come back in September uh, for harvest. Uh, Ryan did mention uh, bird pests being an issue, which I think, yes, it would be an issue uh, on a trial scale. Um, when you get to industrial commercial scale field production, I don't expect that to be uh, as much of an issue. Um, Disease and insects have not been an issue in Montana just because we got more dry environment. There's a possibility of seeing some gray mold show up uh, in your higher moisture, higher uh, humidity environments. In that case, we, there are some decent organic products that'll work. We currently do not have any conventional insecticide or fungicides labeled for hemp. Regarding environment, uh, we can see significant damage from hail and wind if you're in the late, later in the season, August, September, get hit by hail. Uh, but at the same time, we can have a pretty bad hailstorm early in the season, June, uh, let's see, July. Uh, some of our growers got hit pretty hard uh, this past year. And since it was before flowering or before budding, that plant completely got stripped down, leaves completely obliterated, but that crop came back and yielded beautifully. I actually got, let's see, 940 pounds off of that field, even with a uh, near complete uh, destruction from hail, it came back pretty well. If you're irrigating, if you're growing hemp on irrigation, you really got to watch out for overwatering. Uh, once that those roots become waterlogged and can't breathe, um, it can hurt the, the yield pretty good. So be aware of overwatering. Give enough water to get it started and then come back and flowering and put some more on. Other than that, I would not put, I would err on the side of less water than too much. Alrighty, harvest is where the rubber meets the road. Um, you, anybody can grow a crop, seed hemp, get a beautiful stand up and grow on harvest is where it gets a little trickier. Uh, timing is pretty important. Of course, nobody's, very few grain farmers are gonna err on the side of harvesting too early. You know, if you're a wheat farmer, you wait till that, that wheat's completely golden and crisp and so that threshes out and just shatters out the back of the combine. With hemp though, we wanna target actually an intermediate stage between, you know, kind of, that early and late stage. You wanna cut it when those stems are still green, heads are starting to dry out. Uh, if you look at the seeds in the head, we're looking at 70 to 80% maturity. Um, the grain moisture would be anywhere from 10 to 20%. Uh, by targeting this, this mid, you know, this intermediate um, maturity, we're gonna see less wrapping, less uh, fiber catching, on the on the bearings on the on this any spinning shafts 
uh, it just moves a lot better through the combine. Um, if you cut late, you can still get decent yields. Uh, in fact, get all the yield you would have gotten before. It's just uh, much more difficult and you have to be much more careful uh, with your combine. Uh, you're going to have to keep your head as high as possible, limit the amount of biomass going through that combine. Otherwise, uh, you could see that fiber just catching on uh, on a lot of a lot of pieces in that combine. So, just uh, uh, something to be considerate of. You want to plant a little, or I'm sorry, harvest a little earlier than you would naturally want to. Uh, next. So, some other considerations for harvest is. You, when you're growing grain hemp, it's actually a raw uh, product from the field literally to the consumer. Um, there's no kill step, even though, you know, for 20 years they've been farming it like this. We're, we're looking into options to add one just to add some food safety there. But um, it's important to have clean, clean combines, trucks, augers, bins. Um, you don't want a lot of, a lot of bird crap in the, in, the, in the bins or the machinery. Um, also, hemp is, is a gluten-free product naturally, and, it, and it's marketed as gluten-free as well. So getting, getting rid of as much grain in the, the bins or augers is important. Uh, of course, start with a sharp cutter bar because hemp, as you know, hemp fiber is, is the strongest fiber on earth and, uh, and can really cause some issues if your, your cutter bar is dull. There will be some minor modifications of the combine, covering shafts, bearings, uh, all the drag chain to, to limit fire risk. Um, another important thing is to disable your straw chopper. If it's green, some guys, if it's on the greener side, some guys are able to put hemp through their straw chopper, but I'd, uh, I'd advise against doing that. And having water and fire extinguisher on hand is always important, like you would with any other, any other crop. So something is really important for, for grain hemp is storage. You can't just throw it in a bin and, and let it go. Uh, you will need bins with air. You don't need heat necessarily, but you do need aeration. Um, in the Midwest, I'd say f further east, you might have to put heat on it, but North Dakota, Montana, is generally lower humidity, so I wouldn't worry about uh, getting heat on, but air is important, it's critical. You, you wanna get that grain out of the field and on air in a bin within four hours. Uh, so you don't want it to sit overnight in a truck without air. Um, if you run it, if you got comb, comb bottom bins, you wanna flip it after two weeks just to make sure all of that is getting dried down. If you got full floor aeration, Butler bin or, or such, you'll just run run air and uh, till it hits 10% moisture and, and you're good to go. Uh, before you send that grain into the processor to IND hemp or uh, any other processor, you wanna run that seed through a cleaner uh, if you can. Uh, that way you'll, you'll limit any kind of pathogens that might come in with the seed as well as reduce the, um, reduce the trash and and dockage that you, you don't have to deal with on the processor end. Uh, next. All right, so I'm just gonna share a, a little checklist here. If you wanna grow with IND hemp, uh, this is kind of what I go through with a grower. First of all, do you got decent soil? Are you, can you grow a good crop of hemp, of, of wheat? Can you grow a good crop of canola? Uh, you can do a good crop of hemp. Soil pH, you want to get between five and eight. I'd most, you know, you want to shoot for six, but we got guys out uh, in Eastern Washington growing it on, on mid fives. Um, you want a minimum of 12 inches of rainfall. You need a grain drill with accurate seed placement. Uh, any conventional rotary or cylinder based, you know, combine will do the job. And on farm grain storage with air is critical. Uh, and lastly, do your own research as well. Um, this website here is hemptrade.ca uh, has an excellent e-guide. It's very thorough and um, I can't get into the nitty gritty details in a 10 minute seminar, but uh, spend some time on that website. It is, it is really good, really uh, 
covers a lot of information. Uh, in fact, even as a combine settings and such. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, my email address is ben at indhemp.com. Pretty simple, or come to our website, indhemp.com. We're looking for acres and we'd we'll love to love to, to have some production with you. And uh, with that, I'll pass it off to David. Great, thanks, Ben. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about production economics and marketing. Um, probably one of the best things to understand is that we're uh, learning every year uh, and, and kind of using the, the phrase that, that Ben did, you know, we're, we're trying to dial things in a bit. Uh, we are fortunate. I mean, we have had commercial production in Canada, you know, just across the border for 20 years. Uh, but getting it to that, that, local, uh, that, that locally fine-tuned production, it's going to take a little bit of time. A lot of our, our counterparts at other land-grant universities, other extension uh, services in other states, you know, we've, we've been working on this and we're, uh, we're getting better. Um, but again, it's, it, it's learning uh, and, and working with farmers and with, with private industry uh, each year trying to, to ratchet things up a bit. So talk a little bit about crop budgets uh, for the producers. I'm sure you're familiar with these. Uh, NDSU Extension, and uh, like many other states, puts out uh, crop budgets for a number of different crops grown in the state. One of the things that makes hemp different from the other crops you have cr crop budgets for, uh, we don't have that historical information. A lot of what goes into updating a crop budget from year to year is actually looking at the historical data from the year previous in terms of how do farmers actually grow the crop. We don't have data that that's that fine-tuned so we can uh, use that to inform our budgets. At the same time, it doesn't necessarily uh, limit its usefulness, again, because you have to s recognize what a budget is and what it's use used for. Again, it it's really a framework uh, and to give an understanding of costs and benefits, but it's not gonna give you the precision, uh, and in some cases, not even the accuracy for your specific operation. And again, too, if you think about just the state of North Dakota, as large as it is, uh, the experiences of a hemp grower in Langdon uh, versus Dickinson is gonna be fundamentally different. Uh, and of course, right now too, there are different uh, production practices, including in terms of tillage and equipment of how you're gonna do this. And again, we just don't quite have the, the, the breadth of, of information we want to, to really hone things in. Uh, one of the things we always get, uh, add to when we're talking about budgets, first of all, is to understand what they are, which is to give an understanding of, uh, of, of where things are. Uh, but also, too, is to understand the risks. And so within, within, any, within crop production, I mean, there's really two big parts. One is you have yield risk. You know, I, we can't say with certainty what your yield is going to be. Um, ben and Ryan both shared some, some information, some knowledge on how do you uh, do things a certain way to increase the, the expectation or what your expected yield might be. Uh, but again, there's always yield risk with weather and pests and everything else. Um, but you need to, need to be ready for those. Uh, market price may be a, a source of risk if you haven't contracted your crop, although uh, many hemp grain producers do contract uh, some or all of their production each year uh, for the, the last few years as it's been available. And the one thing I'd, I'd add too with this, with this budget idea is that when you get a crop budget, if there's certain places where you know the numbers is to put your own numbers in. Uh, again, the, the budgets that we share, be it the, the traditional crop budgets or the crop budget I'm going to show you in just a second, you know, they're for average uh, operations for, for a, 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 really for a farmer that doesn't exist and almost certainly isn't you. So if you do have those numbers uh, to, to go ahead and, and make use of them. The other thing that goes along with it too in terms of dealing with risk is to go in there and, and, and fiddle with the numbers a bit. To, to identify where thresholds might be for a crop to become unprofitable um, or for uh, certain costs to, to get a little bit bigger than you might want to go, just so you kind of see where the bounds are. So on this slide is, is, a, is a draft budget. It's based on the budget that we shared last year, updated a bit with some more recent numbers. Uh, guided, uh, this is actually structured like University of Nebraska crop budget because they, they show you a little bit more of the insides in terms of how the numbers are calculated than our own budgets at NDSU. Uh, a lot of the information from this, I don't have it on here, but I have it on the budget itself. A lot of the, the knowledge is, is coming from the Canadian side of the border in terms of uh, fertility management, that type of thing. But I'd also go back to the, this as we're learning, and, and, and I know Ben mentioned it and previously Ryan 
mentioned in other conversations of, you know, high yielding wheat is a pretty good, uh, pretty good standard or, or idea to kind of get an idea of what you might want to do for your fertility. And again, there's going to be some, some variability on this. There are uh, an ever increasing number of agronomists and farmers who have experience with this. I was actually surprised last year in Carrington, uh, we had a field day for hemp and there were at least, I would say um, at least if, you know, a dozen folks in, in the, in the, in the real, in the, in the room, or excuse me, not there in the field, who had experience, who had grown, the, who had or were growing the crop, which is, you know, really helpful. And again, to talk to folks like Ben or Ryan, and we have Brian Hansen up at Langton who have this experience, can kind of uh, help us learn a little bit more. Um, again, within all of this, you know, you can have your own expectations in terms of yield, your own uh, labor costs and the like. Uh, and it kind of gets down to, you know, what are you expecting in terms of cost per acre, uh, you know, cost per, in this case, pound of, of seed, and then what your returns might be. And really what we're kind of looking at here is, you know, costs, an, an all-in cost of about 25 cents a pound, uh, and, a, and a strictly cash cost, that is if you already own your land and your machinery, or don't consider it specifically, of about 20 cents a pound. Turning that into, you know, what where the market is at today, uh, what I've heard consistently for, for over the last 12 months is 50 cents for conventional, a dollar for organic. Obviously, the, the devil's in the details and, and, and getting, uh, you know, having a conversation with, with someone who's either contracting for future delivery, forward contracting for delivery this fall, uh, or to, to kind of get a feel for what's going to go on in the spot market. And that kind of is a segue for, for marketing hemp grain. Uh, last year, Frank Olson and myself released a, a quick press release just to give everybody a, a, a heads up and really just more of a reminder to, to take some precautions when getting into a new specialty crop. Uh, for a lot of the producers in North Dakota, Minis you know, Northwest Minnesota, Montana, you know, growing specialty crops is something we've become very familiar with and growing new specialty crops is something we're really familiar with. Uh, with those same precautions applying, it doesn't hurt to go through them again. And probably first and foremost is to do your market research. Again, to know, you know who you might be selling to, what the prices might look like, uh, if you're going to contract, you know, who the buyers might be uh, and, and what they might look like. Uh, I'll actually jump down to the fourth point. One, one piece of that too is, is uh, counterparty risk. Uh, you know, will the buyer be able to pay? And you know, what if they aren't able to pay? Is there a secondary market? Much less concerned about this on the grain side than I am on, on the CBD side. Uh, the CBD uh, industry, you know, which is, again, is distinct, and I'm glad we spent a little bit of time differentiating between the different types of hemp. You know, we already saw a boom and a bust in that industry in a little over a year, and some growers were not able to market their crop, including some who had a, a, a contract to sell to a buyer. Um, I don't think that's, a, you know, anywhere near the risk in hemp grain that it is in CBD, but again, it, you do, do need to do your due diligence. Um, some of the things we touched on just a little bit is quality specifications. You know, this is a food crop, you know, you're going right in. And so you need to be, you need to be sure and, and, and take care to, to meet those, those standards. Uh, you can definitely be discounted heavily, uh, or you might have a rejected load if you don't meet those standards. Uh, the one thing I would say if, if folks become overly concerned is that we do have producers, especially in North Dakota and, and even more so across the border in Manitoba, who have, have, who have grown this crop and been able to meet those specs, you know, for, for quite some time. Uh, another note too, just in general about specialty crop contracting is to know what you're actually contracting for. Is it all the production from an acre? Uh, is it so much and then everything extra, there's an option to buy and so forth. It does become a bit important, uh, especially for those cases, if you're contracting for a specific amount of production and you come up short. In a, in a new crop like hemp grain, you know, would you be able to go and find uh, that type of supply? Uh, and most and most contracts now, you know, don't necessarily include language like that, but you do need to, to take note to see if it does and, and how you might manage that uh, if you went that way. And then finally, too, the traditional ideas of force majeure, you know, what would, you know, what might happen that would make the, the contract uh, uh, null? Uh, you know, what, you know, what type of conditions might be there? Again, no different than any other specialty crop or, or a lot of other contracted production, but, but, but just good knowledge. And one of the things that is different uh, within hemp is the regulatory issues as it is cannabis. 
for the most part, this is all straightforward and I can't speak too much about Montana. Uh, you know, you do need a license to grow the crop. You do have certain uh, reporting requirements uh, as you grow the crop, when you're going to harvest the crop. Uh, in the state of North Dakota, you don't have to uh, track, and I'm not going to say this right, you know, the, the sale of the seed, you know, isn't a, isn't a licensed event. Um, and so you can, you can, you can, you can move the, the grain within the supply chain. One, one of the uh, best practices that's kind of recommended is just have, you know, your license number, have, have that type of documentation as you move the material you know, even within state, but especially interstate, or if you're going to, you know, sell it internationally, just to have that, that information available. So that's really what I had. I'm going to make a quick plug for an event next Thursday at one o'clock. Uh, we're going to have a little roundtable discussion for the hemp industry. Um, I'm actually going to send out a blast to everybody who registered for this event, so, so you have this information. Uh, we're just going to talk about uh, challenges and opportunities in the industry and ways we might go forward. I'll also share a link to that on, on the hemp, uh, the NDSU Crops Hemp page, so you, the same place where you would have registered for this, uh, so you can access it there as well. Um, now that we've kind of moved through the, the presentation part, uh, we're open for uh, Q&A. Uh, you know, please, if you can, use the Q&A tool that we have. Uh, right now, we only have one question, um, which we can answer pretty quickly, but if you have any others, uh, please use that tool. They're, they're, they're easiest to manage that way. We'll also look in chat, which some of you uh, have, you know, have used and might be more comfortable using. Um, and then finally, too, a recording of this uh, webinar will be put on that same hemp website, uh, as well as all that additional information, including the resource that, that Ryan uh, and Leslie produced, uh, so you can look at it at a future date. Um, just jumping quick into the question that we have right here, is will the slides be available to view later? Sure, I'll speak for all three of us. I will go through and, and make sure that it's, that it's got what we want to contain and, and we'll get those on this, the same, uh, same web page with the recording. So you'll be able to access the, the PowerPoint there as well. Uh, moving over to the, the, uh, the questions here. There's a couple coming through on chat. Uh, so, Harold has a question about what specific organic products. Um, and so I think that might be just alluding to, I mean, there is a market for organic material, organic hemp uh, material, processed material, and there's clearly a premium for that. And there's a, a lot of interest. Uh, and again, a, a significant premium if you have uh, organic fields and, and are interested in producing a crop, you get a dollar a pound and have a decent crop, it, it will be a, a fantastic crop and, and something you might, you know, definitely be the, might be the crop you brag about next winter or maybe for, for a few years or decades. Um, in terms of the, the round table, the round table is online. Um, it'll be actually be over a, a Zoom webinar just like this. We, uh, at NDSU, we're still an extension. We're still uh, not allowed to meet face to face and that's probably gonna last for at least a little bit. Um, and we hope that that helps to kind of meet the needs of, uh, of what we're trying to achieve again, which is to kind of build this industry. Uh, great question from Sheldon Thomas. Uh, a co-op model for tribal programs to follow. Uh, that's a, a great question. So we haven't, uh, you know, talking on the organizational side, we haven't really specifically addressed hemp in that, but I, we could. Um, between myself and Frank Olson, who's the, the director of the Center for Cooperatives, uh, you know, I think we'd be happy to have that conversation to see, you know, how can you have this, uh, this cooperative organization uh, be involved in hemp, you know, on the production input side, the, the, um, the collection storage marketing side, it, 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 it's certainly a possibility. I don't think that there would necessarily be too much that would be unique uh, from a tribal standpoint, at least not evident to me right away, Sheldon, but, you know, it's, it's something we could look at. And I do know that uh, you know Turtle Mountain, other other reservations are really interested in hemp, and you know have, have, have really uh, been aggressive in moving forward. Uh, and so you know, Extension's happy to help. And you're in North Dakota, so we can definitely talk a little bit more offline. Uh, we do have a note uh, uh, regarding a request for a copy of the webinar, and we can do that. Um, and are there any other questions? Well, I'm uh, seeing some questions here. Right. Um, we've got questions on that organic materials for controlling weeds or insects. 
Mm -hmm. uh, for weed control, there are, I mean, the best weed control is going to be planting timing. If you've got bad weeds, I'd push off your planting. Let, let a couple flushes get up with some rains. Uh, that's the nice thing about hemp is why it does fit the organic production model so well is that later seeding. Uh, you usually can get a few good hit, um, flushes of the weeds up. Uh, for materials, I mean, there's still even organic herbicides, believe it or not. They're just an acid, essentially paraquat, that's not as toxic to humans, but it's just an acid based off of vinegar based uh, acid that just burns the uh, weeds. But uh, for organic weed control, timing is, is most important. Uh, for insects, you will see insects in the crop, that's for sure. You'll see all sorts of insects, they love it. In fact, um, even honeybees love hemp. Uh, this last year in Southeast Washington, Walla Walla, we were growing some hemp and it was chock full of bees and there wasn't hives for miles around. Um, so as far as controlling insect pests though, usually it won't reach a critical threshold to where you need to spray them out. If you do get a bad outbreak of, you know, um, some insect pests, there are organic pyrethroids available, which you should shy away from. Uh, but there is also neem-based products, so neem oil. And I can go into specific products that you can use uh, for controlling insects and disease, uh, specific insects and disease, uh, if you want to reach out to me. And then DSU is doing some research on, on herbicides, so I'm guessing that that data will be used down the road for approval. Um, but yeah, like Ben said, those um, cultural, biological, different practices. Um, I mean, if by having that tighter row spacing, you can kind of help outcompete the weeds. Um, but if you do have humidity, high humidity in your area, and you're concerned about white mold, um, having some type of aeration by with row, wider row spacing might be a good way to go if that's a concern. And, and one of the next questions is, are we still not able to feed uh, hemp to cattle? And it's not listed as a feed. No part of, of the plant currently is. Uh, there's a process that you need to go through. It, it, you can feed it in, in, on the Canadian side of the border, not in the United States. Uh, there's actually a pretty organized effort to uh, address this issue. Um, and that could be uh, feeding the, the biomass material or the grain itself or the leftover cake after uh, you know, if you're going to crush the, 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 the oil seed. Um, but right now, it, it's not a, an, an accepted uh, feed material. Um, and so that's, again, a little bit of research that has to be done and education and, and a process that at the federal level, especially to, to kind of convince those regulators that it's worthwhile. Um, and also, in general, it's, it's state departments of ag who have the ultimate call on, on, on feed. And you know, right now at this time, even though there's evidence from Europe and practice in Canada that it's fine, uh, we still have to, to work on that at least for a little bit. And, and here in Dickinson and uh, at the Hedinger Research Center this year, we're planning to put hemp in with the cover crop mix to kind of see how it competes with those other crops compared to a monoculture of hemp. And we will be uh, taking samples to look at nutritional value, that kind of stuff too. But we won't be feeding it. Uh, next question, a minimum number of acres needed for, uh, for a commercial crop, and I'd, I'd assume this is for a contract. Um, I don't know, Ben, if you guys have a minimum number. Um, so we, we, our minimum is 60 acres for a contract. That's roughly uh, a truckload of grain so that we can most efficiently transport that grain back to, to Fort Benton for pressing. So 60 acre increments is what we prefer, but that's 60 is our, our minimum. Any, Right, thanks. A uh, next question, what, did I mention the center cooperatives? Yes, I did. Um, and, and one of the things I do when I, I work with uh, new crops is there's a lot of advantages to the cooperative model um, in, in organizing supply, in, in doing some, some things with newer crops. Uh, and again, you know, I, I've worked with Frank Olson a bit on some of these projects. I've worked on a number of projects where sometimes a cooperative model of some type makes sense. Um, and other, in other cases, it doesn't. Um, you know, in the case of hemp grain right now, uh, you know, I don't, you really don't have the chicken and the egg problem, which is one way that uh, co-ops work really well where you have an obligated, you have, where the farmers might own the plant and would be obligated to, to deliver for a new crop. 
here there is a market for for hemp grain and there's a, a market for the materials that are made from it and so you don't have to you don't have to manage that like you would with some other new crops uh and, and, and when and again where in my experience uh, that cooperative model works really well And I don't know if either of you guys want to handle the question about uh, sonolin as a as an allowed yeah. herbicide. Well, you know, uh, Brian, we've we've looked into that. Um, I haven't filed an application for an emergency exemption on sonolin, um, but that's something that's something to consider. We've, there's been talk about it. I haven't begun that ap application myself, but I'm sure if we got enough signatures on it and uh, we should, we could be able to, should be able to push it through, and I haven't tried it yet. And then a question maybe for you, Ben: uh, discounts for mycotoxins? I mean, there are. I mean, and then the specifics are in the contract. Yeah, yeah. Specifics are in the contract if you're if you're looking for that. And and yeah, we are keeping track of uh, pathogens such as E. coli, listeria. Um, generally, on that side of of things. If you clean your seed and dry it down, you're not going to run into any issues. Those pathogens tend to stick into the uh, the flower material, the chaff, the residue, and those seeds with the clean shell carry very little uh, risk for for pathogens on them. Yeah, and then another question for you, Ben: You contract certain varieties? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm glad you asked that because that's that's uh, kind of our our our. The the hap, you know the thing I'm happiest about is we got um, we've got distribution rights for X59, uh, which is actually one of the most the most popular varieties in Canada. It's been proven for decades, and uh, it has an excellent agronomic package, excellent uh, quality processing quality. It's big seed, as well as end of market use. People actually ask for this specific variety, and the yield. If you look back on uh, Ryan's uh, notes there. The yield on X59 is is one of the best. I, uh, usually tops the chart one or two. So that's a variety we contract with. Yeah, there's another question about a market in North Dakota for fiber, and the answer is not yet. Um, you know, there's a lot of work being done in in the fiber space. Again, as mentioned, I mean it is a it is a a very strong fiber, uh, and there's there are commercial uses for it. Uh, but we really are missing is that middle piece, um, the folks who will uh, take it from a farmer and get it into a form that uh, someone further down the supply chain might want. Um, but there's definitely a lot of work going into that. And there's, you know, discussion of folks who are, are, are close or ready to contract for it. And then Ben, I don't know if you wanted to mention anything about what Inthemp is doing in that space. Or Mike, if you want to jump in. Sure, sure I guess, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. So yeah, we're, um, I am Mike Kerman. I'm also with IND Hemp. We're, as you, you know, we have a oil seed processing facility in Fort Benton and we are following that with a straw processing operation. We've acquired equipment and we'll be building the uh, plant this, this summer and fall. Um, that is straw. Um, we, we will be acquiring straw and our contracts this year will include options to acquire that straw. Um, so as far as markets, it's, uh, we're trying to find an added value or have be able to dual crop our grain uh, with our grain growers just to add a little additional value. Uh, we're working on the development of the downstream markets, but our facility will do primary decortication. Uh, goal being having hemp, the hemp herd available for for further processing and use in animal bedding and the like. And then the bass fiber, again, available for uh, what they call non-woven products or for further processing into uh, true fiber products. Uh, that's a, another development piece that'll take more investment and uh, at partnering. But yes, there will be markets in the region for, for the hemp straw in, uh, in the next year, I would believe. And I'm sure there are others that are working on this as well. You know, Chad Olvin, of course, at uh, NDSU also has been involved in the use of and uh, development of, of products and working in that space. So I'd suggest you follow up and, and look at some of what he's done as well. 
Great. Now we have a question about act of God clauses in the contract. And I don't know if Ben or Mike, you have any specific comments. I mean, I would assume they're, they're template boilerplate type type comments or clauses. Yes. They're act of God clauses. If you have a loss due to hail or some other act of God, we're not going to hold you to, to the agreement. They're uh, reasonable. Same on our side. If our place burns down, we may not be able to take the grain, but otherwise we're going after it. Yeah, and, and one thing I'd mentioned, I, I, I glossed over a bit is, you know, insurance is now available, was available in 2020 for the first time as part of a, as a whole farm policy. Uh, the, the, uh, the deadline for applying for a policy like that happened, has passed, it was March 15th. Uh, but again, we've had producers, you know, grow this crop without insurance in the past. Um, you know, but that, that product is available. It actually was, went through really, really quickly. A, a lot of work was done by the, the, the analysts who, who, who put the package together and, and we'll know more and, and the insurance may end up looking even more appealing in the future uh, as we know more about yields across the country. But you know, the, the, the idea of risk management is, is, is definitely important, you know, be it that act of God clause insurance or otherwise. As we're kind of working through the, the end of the questions here, I was wondering if the two other panelists, if you guys had any other comments or things you thought of while we were visiting that you might want to add. I would add that there are, uh, you know, Roger Gusius, I think he's here. He's with Healthy Oil Seeds. He's in Carrington, North Dakota. He's been processing hemp grain for several years and is, uh, is uh, available, I'm sure, and can answer questions for people in the region. I'm not sure if he's still contracting, but he's a friend of ours, and I want to shout out to him. And uh, there's a question about demand for food-grade oil. Uh, there is a demand for those oil products. We are just beginning to get our products into the market, but there's basically the hemp oil, the hemp hearts, and the hemp protein products, all of which the hemp oil and the hemp hearts are the are being used more in the human side. Uh, certainly the hemp protein, the enriched hemp protein is also used. Uh, there are multiple manufacturers that are currently uh, selling primarily Canadian produced products, but we look to displace those folks on the shelf at our earliest convenience. Uh, I don't know if I have anything else to add uh, in that regard. Uh, I guess there's a question about banking. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also, um, we do have references. We can uh, connect you with our friends at uh, Bank of the West. They're uh, in both Minnesota and North Dakota. They're our banker. Uh, they've been, uh, Jeff Birch, who's there, can uh, help orient you. There's, they're a large commercial bank that is actively working. Uh, and there are working groups to help identify uh, and the compliance issues. For most lenders, uh, this is a new product and they have to establish internal compliance requirements to be sure that they're verifying when they're lending or working with people working in the now legal hemp space that you are working in hemp and not marijuana and so it depends on your bank and what their compliance requirements are but there's been good progress on on the banking yep and, and again i mean we do have a, a a commercial hemp industry i mean it's fledgling and this is the next year so there are lenders in the region uh and it, you know Bank of the West is one of those who who are willing to to, to lend. Um, some are not, and that's quite important to note. And in, in a lot of conversations I've had, where where lenders, you know, if that is going to be part of your operation, that you're going to have to move your entire operation elsewhere. So I mean, it's something to to definitely uh, think about, talk about, and and, and likely too, if you're going to move into something like this, is to have that conversation with your lender as it is. And uh, John Mortensen mentioned in our chat here. Um, the ND uh, Department of Ag is currently licensing, but the process will be much slower due to COVID-19. So if they wish to grow this year, they need to get moving on that process. So and it looks like Bank of the West won't do CBD, but will do feed and fiber. So. That's correct. I see there's a question about delivery dates. Uh, I assume that means when you deliver your grain. Our process is, you know, we don't have, we're not an elevator, so we do not have storage for all of the grain that we contract for. So we do uh, call for grain as we, as we demand it. We run, we'll run uh, conventional and organic uh, runs as soon as our final organic certification is complete. Uh, 
So we basically call for the grain uh, based on the priority or our contracting. When you contract with us, we go down the list and just go by from former one to 30, however many we have. When we call for the grain, we usually request a sample uh, that be sent from the farm several weeks before we're going to bring it in. That sample will be reviewed at the site and we send samples out for third party uh, microcontamination assessment. If this grain comes back within our the parameters in our contract for micros, then we schedule when you, when you deliver it. You deliver your grain uh, on the scheduled date and uh, we, we settle within uh, I think 15 days where we, we do have a settlement process where we look at uh, for foreign material. It's very important for this crop and it, we highly encourage our growers to clean the grain before it goes to the bin for drying. Any, we've definitely seen a direct correlation between the amount of foreign material, basically chaff and other organics in with the grain and the microcontamination that's, that occurs over the period of storage. So it's very important to not only dry it down, but do your best to clean it. You get it in, you know, we're, we're being very lax on our foreign matter this year. You know, we're not docking uh, over, if you're getting in under 10%. We do provide a dockage report and feedback to our growers as to how, uh, what, what the um, condition of their grain was, and we're really trying to help that out. So it's a little bit more than just a delivery date, but it is important to understand, and it's a good question. Great, thanks, Mike. I, I think we've exhausted all of the questions. Um, I want to thank uh, Ryan and Ben uh, for for serving as panelists today, and Mike for some additional knowledge from from the uh, private side of things. Uh, for everyone who participated too, thanks for taking the time. Uh, we will post the recording and the slides uh, to the the website on the screen, uh, so you're de definitely welcome to go check that out, as well as the all the addition, other information that's there already and that might be coming in, in, in future weeks. I will make one last quick comment because uh, Wesson with the Montana Department of Ag uh, is licensing and they did, okay, this is good to know. Uh, Montana Department of Ag has extended their deadline until June 1st. So that's, that's good to hear. Um, and so duly noted, um, with that, I wanna thank everybody for joining us and have a great afternoon. Bye.